Welcome to the Farm Gen Ed program, Clinical Applications of Pharmacogenomics. My name is Dr. Joe Ma, and I will be presenting the information in these slides along with Dr. Grace Quo and Dr. Kelly Lee. All copyrighted content included within this presentation has been granted copyright permission by the copyright owners. No part of this presentation can be reproduced in any form without permission of the rights holder. We will review the use of pharmacogenomic tests in five therapeutic areas. Infectious disease, oncology, anticoagulation, psychiatry, and neurology. Within each therapeutic area, we will include the following. The gene or allele of interest, the functional effect of the gene or allele, the prevalence of the relevant alleles in various populations, the available genomic tests, a summary of the most significant clinical data available to date regarding drug dosing and selection, drug efficacy, drug toxicity, and finally, recommendations for genomic testing from reputable agencies or national guidelines. Upon completion of this program, participants will be able to identify therapeutic areas in which pharmacogenomic testing can be applied in the clinical setting, evaluate the limitations and benefits of pharmacogenomic testing, summarize evidence-based recommendations for pharmacogenomic testing, using patient case scenarios, formulate a plan for pharmacogenomics testing based upon available scientific evidence, and identify resources for obtaining current pharmacogenomic information. The first example of pharmacogenomic testing is from the area of infectious disease. This is the pretest question. The question will be repeated later as a post-test question, and the answer will then be provided. HIV-positive patients with the HLA-B star 5701 genetic variation and taking a Bacavir are at increased risk for which of the following events? Options are A, bleeding, B, serotonin syndrome, C, hypersensitivity reaction, or D, tumor recurrence. We'll start with the case of a 29-year-old Caucasian male with HIV. He presents with fever, gastrointestinal upset, and skin rash on his forearms and trunk of his body. His labs revealed a viral load of 50,000 copies and a CD4 count of 100. He has no known drug allergies. For three months, he has been taking abacavir, zidovidine, efavirenz, and septra. The photo shows the patient's arm with a rash that is raised in red. In this section, we will focus on abacavir, a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor with activity against HIV. A Bacavir-induced hypersensitivity reaction, or HSR, is a primary treatment-limiting toxicity for a Bacavir. HSR occurs in 5 to 8% of all people exposed to a Bacavir during the first six weeks of treatment, but reactions can occur any time. Rechallenging a person with a Bacavir-induced HSR is contraindicated. The allele HLA-B, star 5701, confers a high risk of abacavir-induced HSR. Symptoms of HSR may include fever, rash, GI, and respiratory symptoms, and general malaise. Untreated HS HSR can lead to significant hypotension and possibly even death. These symptoms may occur due to the interaction of, of abacavir or its metabolite with MHC class 1, leading to CD8-positive T-cell-mediated cell death. Upon initiation of abacavir therapy, the prevalence of HLA-B star 5701 is highest among Caucasians at 5 to 8 percent. Among Asians, the risk is 0 to 2 percent, with Indians at the high end and Chinese and Japanese having lower risk. About 1% of Hispanics and 0.5% of African Americans carry the allele. HLA-B star 5701 is detected using standard HLA typing. Sequence-based genotyping is considered the gold standard, and PCR using sequence-specific primers is the most widely used technique. Studies have demonstrated that fewer than 1% of HLA-B star 5701 negative patients develop HSR in response to abacavir, 
while more than 70% of HLA-B star 571 positive patients will develop the reaction. Two cost-effectiveness studies showed that HLA-B star 571 screening was cost-effective among Caucasians, but less so in ethnic groups with lower prevalence. Dosing is not affected by pharmacogenomic testing, but drug selection may be affected. There is currently no literature related to how pharmacogenomics impacts abacavir efficacy. However, an association between abacavir and toxicity, the HSR, has been demonstrated in prospective studies, as well as in retrospective and case control studies. The PREDICT-1 study showed that HLA-B star 571 screening can accurately predict patients who may be at risk for abacavir hypersensitivity. This was a double-blind, randomized, controlled study of HIV-positive patients who were mostly white in Australia and Europe. Two groups were compared in this study, those who received the standard of care and those who received prospective screen for HLA-B star 5701. The incidence of confirmed abacavir HSR was 2.7% among unscreened patients versus 0% among screened patients. Similar results emerged from the SHAPE study. This was a retrospective case-controlled study. 47 of 199 white and black patients had suspected HSR cases with confirmation from skin patch testing. It should be noted that skin patch testing identifies patients who had an immunologically mediated HSR to abacavir. However, it is only useful for confirmation of suspected HSR cases, and it does not work in those without previous exposure to abacavir. In this study, HLA-B star 571 screening accurately predicted 100% of abacavir HSR cases. Finally, the ARI study was a North American multi-center open-label open prospective study. The investigators found that fewer than 1% of HLA-B star 571 negative patients had clinically suspected HSR and none had a positive skin patch test at 30 weeks. Screening for HLA-B star 571 prior to initiation of abacavir therapy is recommended by the Department of Health and Human Services guidelines. It is also recommended in the black box warning of the prescribing information. Patients testing positive for the HLA-B star 571 allele should not be prescribed a bacavir if other options are available. Note that testing after initiation may not be useful unless you are verifying toxicity similar to our patient case scenario. Be aware that patients who are negative for the HLA-B star 5701 allele may still have a risk of developing an HSR. Case reports have shown that patients lacking this allele may still respond negatively, so monitoring of, this, of these patients is crucial. So let's come back to the self-assessment question. HIV-positive patients with the HLA-B star 5701 genetic variation and taking abacavir are at increased risk for which of the following? A, bleeding, B, serotonin syndrome, C, hypersensitivity reaction, or D, tumor recurrence? The answer is C hypersensitivity reaction. Let's return to the case study. The patient was screened for HLA-B star 5701 and he tested positive. We concluded that the symptoms were due to abacavir and not the result of other medications such as Septra or another antiretroviral. Consequently, abacavir was discontinued. Because of the application of pharmacogenomic principles in this case, it was not necessary to discontinue other suspected medications that may have caused the rash, a path which could have resulted in opportunistic infections and potentially worsening disease progression. The patient continued to be monitored for worsening hypersensitivity and other complications such as hepatomegaly, lactic acidosis, toxic epidermal necrolysis, or Stevens-Johnson syndrome. However, as commonly occurs, rash, the rash resolved within discontinuation of abacavir. Current guidelines recommend that patients experiencing abacavir-related HSR not be rechallenged with abacavir. The second example of pharmacogenomic testing is from the area of oncology. Next, we will focus on trastuzumab and the gene for human epidermal growth factor receptor, or HER2. 
HER2 is a proto-oncogene that is overexpressed in about a third of invasive breast carcinomas. Overexpression of HER2 is correlated with reduced disease-free time and overall survival. Trastuzumab is a monoclonal antibody which binds to the HER2 protein on the surface of tumor cells, inhibiting the proliferation of the tumor cells. Trastuzumab is indicated for adjuvant treatment of HER2 overexpressing breast cancer. Currently, there is no evidence HER2 expression differs by race. However, HER2 levels may be inversely related to body mass index among premenopausal women. HER2 testing is done in almost all women with breast cancer, not just those being considered for trastuzumab. A negative result for HER2 testing does not rule out HER2 expression and potential benefit from trastuzumab or other drugs that target HER2. There are two genomic tests that have been FDA approved for HER2 status, fluorescence in situ hybridization, or FISH, and immunohistochemistry, or IHC. A positive result on either test indicates overexpression, overexpression of HER2. FISH directly detects the underlying HER2 gene alteration in the patient's tumor cells, while IHC measures the abundance of HER2 protein. FISH may be favored over the IHC technique. Accurate testing is important, and pathology reports may contain inconclusive results. One test may not be enough to determine with certainty whether the tumor is HER2 positive. In certain cases, both tests may need to be completed. Trastuzumab dosing is not affected by pharmacogenomic testing, but drug selection is affected. Trastuzumab plus chemotherapy in patients with HER2-positive breast cancer are associated with increased time to disease progression, longer median survival time, and decreased risk of death in metastatic breast cancer. Adjuvant trastuzumab given with paclitaxel in patients with HER2-positive breast cancer resulted in increased disease-free survival and decreased risk of death compared to chemotherapy alone. Unfortunately, there is insufficient evidence to support continued treatment with trastuzumab monotherapy or with chemotherapy after progression of disease. Regarding toxicity, trastuzumab alone is associated with a 5% risk of cardiomyopathy. There is limited evidence of increased risk of cardiotoxicity from trastuzumab if one copy of the isoleucine 655 valine allele variant of HER2 gene is present. Testing for isoleucine 655 valine allele is currently not standard of care. Testing for HER2, stat HER2 status is necessary prior to initiation of trastuzumab, and this is reflected in the prescribing information. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network Task Force report provides guidelines about IHC and FISH cutoff scores to determine HER2 status. However, the Evaluation of Genomic Applications in Practice and Prevention, or EGAP, does not yet have recommendations for the use of genomic tests for trastuzumab. The third example of pharmacogenomic testing is from the area of anticoagulation. This is the pretest question. The question will be repeated later as a post-test question, and the answer will then be provided. Which polymorphisms will most likely influence warfarin dosing? Options are A, CYP2C9 and VCOR C1, B, CYP2C19 and VCOR C1, C, CYP2D6 and VCOR C9, or D, CYP2D6 and VCOR C1. In this section, we will focus on warfarin, an oral anticoagulant widely used to prevent and treat thromboembolic diseases in patients with D-vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, mechanical heart valves, and atrial fibrillation. It is associated with significant risk of major and sometimes fatal bleeding events. Close monitoring of international normalized ratios, or INR, is needed during treatment. This figure illustrates how warfarin is metabolized and how it's affected by enzymes encoded by CYP2C9 and VCOR C1. First, polymorphisms in CYP2C9, which encodes the enzyme 
P450-2C9 may influence the metabolism of warfarin. Warfarin is a racemic mixture of two active isomers. The S isomer is three to five times more potent than the R isomer. It is metabolized by CYT2C9 and excreted in bile. The R isomer is metabolized by related enzymes and excreted renally. In addition, the dosing of warfarin may be affected by polymorphisms in V-Core C1, which encodes a subunit of vitamin K epoxide reductase, or the V-Core. V-Core is needed for reduction of vitamin K, which in turn activates coagulation factors. The liver takes a free warfarin, which inhibits the V-Core complex. By blocking reduction of vitamin K, warfarin interferes with the formation of coagulation factors. We will start with the interaction of warfarin and CYP2C9. The wild type or reference allele is CYP2C9 star 1. Polymorphisms have given rise to the CYP2C9 star 2 and star 3 alleles. The wild type CYP2C9 star 1 star 1 genotype results in normal clearing of S warfarin, while carriers of either the CYP2C9 star 2 or star 3 allele have impaired metabolism of S. warfarin. The consequence of reduced metabolism of S. warfarin is an increase in drug concentration. About 3 to 20 percent of Caucasians carry one of these alleles, while only 1 to 4 percent of Asians are carriers. Other alleles of CYP2C9 also exist, such as star 5, 6, 8, 11, which may also impair the metabolism of S. warfarin. However, these are much rarer than CYP2C9 star 2 or star 3. The gene for vitamin K epoxide reductase complex subunit 1, or V-core C1, harbors several polymorphisms, including 1173C to T polymorphism, negative 1639G to A, also known as 3673G to A. These two SNPs decrease V-core enzymatic activity and therefore the activation of clotting factors. Consequently, less warfarin is required to inhibit coagulation. Other variants may increase enzymatic activity. <clears throat> These two SNPs, along with eight more, combine to form nine different haplotypes. Five of these haplotypes are independently associated with higher or lower warfarin dose requirements leading to their categorization into two groups. The group A includes haplotypes 1 and 2 associated with requiring a lower warfarin dose. The 1173C2T and negative 1639G2A variants are found in group A haplotypes. Group B includes haplotypes 7, 8, and 9 associated with requiring a higher warfarin dose. The V-Core C1 1173C to T variant is more commonly found in Asians than in Caucasians and African Americans. Likewise, the V-Core C1 negative 1639G to A polymorphism is more prevalent among Asians than Caucasians. The group A haplotype is more often found among Asians, while the group B haplotype has a higher prevalence among Caucasians and African Americans. Each person carries two haplotypes, which together comprise the genotype. Among Caucasians, the frequency of genotype AA, which leads to a lower warfarin requirement, is about 18%. Genotype BB, which results in a higher warfarin requirement, occurs in 35% of Caucasians. Many genomic tests have been approved for detecting variants in CYP2C9 and V-Core C1. A recent study compared four genotyping platforms, and all four methods demonstrated greater than 95% accuracy for identifying CYP2C9 star 2 and star 3, as well as the V-Core C1 negative 1639 or 1173 sequences. A systematic review found that there is more analytic validity data for CYP2C9 than for V-Core C1. Sensitivity and specificity for CYP2C9 genotyping was greater than 98%, but unfortunately, we don't have enough information for V-Core C1. Turnaround time is less than six hours, but it may take longer 
depending on transport and lab specifics for these lab tests. There is limited evidence on which specific variants of CYP2C9 and VCORE C1 should be included in the current tests. Additional areas of uncertainty include long-term performance of tests and consistency between laboratories. The variability in warfarin dosing among Caucasians and Asians can be explained by the combination of VCORE C1 and CYP2C9 polymorphisms, together with other clinical factors such as age, height, body weight, interacting drugs, and indication for warfarin therapy. VCORE C1 and CYP2C9 polymorphisms are sought to account for 23% and 17% of the variability, respectively. CYP2C9 variant alleles lead to lower warfarin dose requirements. Further, a gene dose relationship exists between CYP2C9 polymorphisms and warfarin dose. Having two copies of a variant allele results in lower dose requirements than having only one copy of a variant allele. Multiple VCORE C1 polymorphisms are clustered into the A and B haplotypes. The combination of haplotypes influences the warfarin dose requirement. Genotype AA is associated with requiring a lower warfarin dose, and genotype BB is associated with requiring a higher warfarin dose. The AB genotype is associated with requiring an intermediate warfarin dose. This figure illustrates the influence of CYP2C9 and VCORE C1 alleles on warfarin dose. Variations in warfarin dose are indicated on the y-axis. Zero is equivalent to the standard warfarin dose given to a CYP2C9 star 1 star 1 or the wild type patient. Along the x-axis are various CYP2C9 and VCORE C1 genotypes. Carriers of CYP2C9 star 2 or star 3 alleles require a smaller warfarin dose than normal. VCORE C1 genotypes also influence warfarin dose positively or negatively. There have been many studies that have compared genotype guided versus standard dosing for warfarin. Here we report the results of a 2009 multicenter trial of more than 4,000 patients requiring target INR between two and three. The authors compare three dosing algorithms for warfarin, a pharmacogenetic algorithm, which combines both clinical information and genetic information to make dose recommendations, a fixed dose approach, which is 35 milligrams per week of warfarin, or a clinical algorithm. These data from the same study demonstrate that the pharmacogenetic algorithm was more accurate than the fixed or clinical algorithms at predicting the necessary dose for patients in two groups. One is those requiring less than or equal to 21 milligrams per week of warfarin, or those requiring more than or equal to 49 milligrams per week of warfarin. The data shown here are from an analysis of the entire cohort. Similar results were seen also in an analysis of a validation cohort. And it should be noted that these algorithms have not been validated, and there are many models that incorporate genetic information from CYP2C9 and VCORE C1. Genetic testing may guide the initial warfarin dose, but its utility may be limited once the therapeutic dose is achieved. Genetic testing may decrease time to stabilization of the dose, but the long-term impact on safety is unknown. No literature suggests that testing would affect selection of the drug. Regarding efficacy, genetic testing may be useful to improve the prediction of stable doses, resulting in smaller and fewer dosing changes. And finally, we consider toxicity. The clinical sensitivity of CYP2C9 testing to identify serious bleeding events is 46% which means that about half of all serious bleeding events will occur among CYP2C9 wild type. The clinical specification or specificity of CYP2C9 testing is 69%. In other words, one-third of individuals without a bleeding event will have a variant genotype. The relative risk for serious bleeding in variant versus wild type individuals is 1.7. 
CYP2C9 testing may decrease the risk of serious bleeding events, but may increase the risk of clotting events. Therefore, the risk must be weighed against the benefit. In 2007, the FDA updated labeling of warfarin to include information on pharmacogenetic testing, encouraging use of this information to guide dosing of warfarin. Pharmacogenomic testing is not required for patients currently on warfarin therapy. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services will pay for pharmacogenomic testing for those who are enrolled in clinical studies, those who have not been previously tested, or those who have received fewer than five days of warfarin. Here we come to the post-test question. Which polymorphisms will most likely influence warfarin dosing? The options are CYP2C9 and vcor c one B, CYP2C19 and vcor c one C, CYP2D6 and vcor c nine or D, CYP2D6 and vcor c one the correct answer is A, CYP2C9, and vcor c one The fourth example of pharmacogenomic testing is from the area of psychiatry. We'll start with a patient case. A 45-year-old Asian man has been recently diagnosed with recurrent major depression. He would like a recommendation for a new antidepressant. He has tried paroxetine in the past, but has had significant nausea and diarrhea. Despite a lower dose, the patient has still has adverse effects, and there has been no improvement in depressive symptoms. Should pharmacogenomic testing be used to predict his response and minimize potential SSRI toxicity? In this section, we'll focus on a class of drugs called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, and how they're affected by cytochrome P450 enzymes. These enzymes are encoded by CYP2C9, CYP2D6, CYP1A2, CYP3A4, and others. De decreased CYP activity confers a poor metabolizer phenotype, while increased enzyme activity confers an ultra-rapid metabolizer phenotype. Multiple enzymes are involved in SSRI metabolism, but CYP2D6 is the most important enzyme for this class of drugs. These data illustrate the correlation between the CYP2D6 genotype and phenotype and the expected effects from usual SSRI doses. A person with two copies of the wild-type allele, as depicted in the second row, represents the normal scenario. This person, described as an extensive metabolizer, has the expected drug concentrations and response. However, additional copies of the wild-type gene result in excess CYPX enzyme activity, as seen in the top row. This leads to an ultra-rapid metabolizer phenotype, characterized by subtherapeutic drug concentrations and no response. Conversely, if both CYP2D6 alleles are inactivated, the person is a poor metabolizer. In this case, higher than expected drug concentrations occur, leading to adverse reactions. This table indicates the frequencies of various cytochrome P450 alleles in different populations. When prescribing SSRIs, it is important to consider the allele frequencies in your patient population. This may affect the patient phenotype, which in turn influences drug concentrations, adverse effects, and other clinical effects. Various cytochrome P450 genotype platforms exist that have been approved for CYP2D6 and CYP2C19 by the FDA. The results may be used to predict how a patient will respond to SSRIs as well as to other drugs which are also metabolized by CYP enzymes. The sensitivity and specificity of available pharmacogenomic tests for CYP2D6, CYP2C9, CYP2C19 are high. Among these, CYP2D6 genotyping is supported by the most compelling evidence. Single-dose SSRI studies in healthy volunteers show that the poor metabolizer genotype for CYP2D6 and CYP2C19 correlates with increased SSRI concentrations and decreased clearance. The limitations of these dosing studies include the use of healthy volunteers, small sample sizes, and not accounting for multiple cytochrome P450 enzymes that influence SSRI metabolism. 
regarding the efficacy of genomic testing, there's conflicting evidence from cross-sectional studies about the relationship between clinical response and cytochrome P450 genotypes. The limitations of these efficacy studies include that none were prospective randomized trials, they had small sample sizes, only two of the five studies looked at individual SSRIs, and the studies did not account for rest, race, ethnicity, diet, or concomitant medications. Therefore, no conclusion can be made about the relationship between cytochrome P450 genotypes and the efficacy of SSRI treatment in non-psychotic depression. Regarding toxicities, there's conflicting evidence linking CYP2D6 polymorphisms and rates of SSRI adverse effects, which were primarily gastrointestinal effects such as nausea and vomiting. None of the studies were prospective randomized trials and no conclusions may be made about the relationship between CYP genotypes and the adverse effects of SSRIs. Again, poor study design with small sample sizes led to this conclusion. In conclusion, there is insufficient evidence to support a recommendation for or against testing prior to initiating treatment with SSRIs for non-psychotic depression. Further, there are no specific recommendations for testing CYP enzyme activity. The final example of pharmacogenomic testing is from the area of neurology. This is the pretest question. The question will be repeated later as a post-test question, and the answer will then be provided. What is the current pharmacogenomic testing recommendation for carbamazepine? Options are A, test all patients prior to starting carbamazepine, B, test high-risk patients only prior to starting carbamazepine, C, test patients only if they have a history of hypersensitivity reactions, or D, test patients only if they develop a hypersensitivity reaction. In this section, we'll focus on carbamazepine, which is indicated as an anticonvulsant, a mood stabilizer, for migraine prophylaxis, and for many other conditions. HLA-B star-1502 increases the risk of severe carbamazepine-induced hypersensitivity reactions, such as Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. These may be life-threatening. Other alleles, such as HLA-A star-3101, and HLA-B star-1511 have also been shown to increase the risk of a carbamazepine-induced cutaneous hypersensitivity reactions. Mild reactions such as macular papular exanthema may result, as well as severe conditions like hypersensitivity syndrome, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and toxic epidermal necrolysis. The drug-induced hypersensitivity reactions are thought to occur due to the interaction of carbamazepine with MHC class 1, leading to CD8 T-cell-mediated death. In contrast, the frequency of HLA-B star-1502 differs widely among different ethnicities. It is significantly higher among Han Chinese and other East Asians. According to the FDA, 10 to 15 percent of patients may carry HLA-B star-1502 in parts of China, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Taiwan. The frequency is intermediate among South Asians. The prevalence of the allele is negligible among Japanese, Koreans, and Caucasians. HLA-A star-3101 allele is distributed among populations of different ancestries. The frequency of the allele is 2 to 5 percent in Northern Europeans, 2 to 3 percent in Han Chinese, and 7 to 12 percent in Japanese. HLA-B star-1511 allele is distributed among different populations as well. The frequency of the allele is Singaporeans 2 percent, Koreans 3 to 4 percent, Taiwanese 1 to 2 percent, and among Caucasians and African Americans, 0%. Standard HLA typing may be used to detect either allele. Patients are considered positive if either one or two copies of a relevant HLA allele are present. In other words, both heterozygotes and homozygotes are at risk. Dosing is not influenced by HLA testing, but selection of the drug is affected. HLA status is not known to affect clinical efficacy of carbamazepine. Carbamazepine toxicity is associated with the HLA-B star-1502 and HLA-A star-3101 alleles. Incidence of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis is less than two patients per million per year. Rate of death with these conditions in absence of carbamazepine range from 5% and 35% for Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis, respectively. 
there is a high incidence of cutaneous drug reactions within three months of therapy. As stated previously, carbamazepine hypersensitivity is associated with HLA-B star 1502. In three studies of Han Chinese subjects, this allele was present in 98 to 100% of carbamazepine-induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome cases. Among Han Chinese, a test for HLA-B star 1502 provides 96% sensitivity and 88% specificity for predicting Stevens-Johnson and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Ethnicity must be considered when predicting the risk of carbamazepine hypersensitivity. The HLA-B star 1502 allele is more common in Asians than other races. It is not associated with Stevens-Johnson or toxic epidermal necrolysis among Japanese or Caucasians. HLA-A star 3101 is also associated with carbamazepine hypersensitivity in, in different populations, including Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and Caucasians. Among Japanese, a test for HLA-A star 3101 provides 58% sensitivity and 87% specificity for predicting hypersensitivity. Among Caucasians, the test for HLA-A star 3101 provides 26% sensitivity and 96% specificity. Currently, the FDA does not provide any recommendation regarding testing for HLA-A star 3101. The FDA does recommend testing for HLA-B star 1502 prior to initiation of carbamazepine therapy in patients with at-risk Asian ancestry. The increased risk and recommendation for testing are included in the black box warning. A study in Thailand that has suggested that HLA-B star 1502 testing may be cost-effective for the prevention of carbamazepine-induced Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis if an allele-specific test is used rather than a complex test for several HLA alleles. Based upon Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium guidelines, patients who are non-carriers of HLA-B star 1502 have normal or reduced risk of carbamazepine-induced risk of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis and dosing should be per standard guidelines. Carriers of HLA-B star 1502 have increased risk of carbamazepine-induced Stevens-Johnson and toxic epidermal necrolysis, and the recommendation is not to use the drug in those who have not previously received carbamazepine. If patients have previously used carbamazepine for greater than three months without any adverse drug reactions, the recommendation is to use the drug with caution. This is the post-test question. What is the current pharmacogenomic testing for recommendation for carbamazepine? Options are A, test in all patients prior to starting carbamazepine, B, test in high-risk patients only prior to starting carbamazepine, C, test in patients only if they have a history of hypersensitivity reactions, or D, test in patients only if they develop a hypersensitivity reaction. The answer is B, test in high-risk patients only prior to starting carbamazepine. We acknowledge the PharmGenet authors as well as our consultants and reviewers for making these slides available. We hope this information is helpful as you translate pharmacogenomic evidence into practice. If you have questions or comments, please email us at pharmacogenomics at ucsd.edu. Our references are all posted on our PharmGenet website, https pharmacogenomics.ucsd.edu. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Thank you.